Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three early uh, starting adventures for Shadow Dark. Uh, I'm going to start with Frostmire and the Catacombs of Whispering Rats, the Sepulchre of Dusk, and then the Swamp Dragon Cult, which is by Elven Tower. I have a bunch of Elven Tower adventures. This is the first one I've really done a quick, you know, like a, a, a flip through for an examination of. And I think all three of these are really interesting in their own way. This one is cool because it's a level one adventure that actually has a dragon. You know, we often, well, this isn't Dungeons and Dragons, this is Shadow Dark, but in Dungeons and Dragons, there are often no dragons. <laughs> you don't really run into them all that often. And so it's cool when you have a low level adventure with a dragon in it. Now, this one is one of those really risky ones where the dragon is super powerful relative to the players, so they can't really kill it, at least not right away. But it's a great introductory introductory adventure that deals with dragons and sets up for maybe a, a longer term adventure or campaign, kind of trying to deal with that dragon. So I like that a lot. The Sepulchre of Dusk is a really cool adventure as well. There's a lot here, a lot going on, and it's a, it's a really interesting... I would say visceral adventure. You really get a feeling of this one. It doubles down into the really oppressive shadow dark side of things. And I like that. It's cool. It's a really cool adventure. And then uh, this one, Frostmire and the Catacombs of Whispering Rats, is a really cool early, I would say like stereotypical, but not in a bad way, starting adventure. It's a dungeon crawl, and it's got a lot of cool stuff, a lot of puzzles, a lot of riddles, a lot of references from one room to the other. Great use of random encounters and cool tables for you know NPCs. It's a good adventure, a really good adventure to start with. All three of these you can get on DriveThruRPG, and they're all really cheap, like less than, I think I got all of these for like, I don't know, less than $10 as a, as a whole. Uh, certainly, they're, they're, they're each pretty cheap individually. I'll put links below to where you can get them if you're interested. So this first one, uh, Frostmire, is a sandbox adventure, but I don't really think that that's actually properly true. It's not really a sandbox. I mean, it is a sandbox in one sense, but it's not like a hex crawl. It's not a large region or anything. It's just a town and a dungeon. So I'm not sure I would really call it a sandbox adventure, but uh, he does, and that's okay. Um, you know, it's uh, totally fine. <laughs> just a, It's just a word, but I think it's more properly speaking a dungeon crawl. It's not really a sandbox. Um, the first couple pages are great. You get a summary with details, a dramatis personae, uh, and the adventure hooks. They're all really good. And I think the kind of the idea here is that there's this plague that's being spread by rats. And there are a couple other things here that are going on. One thing I would say is that everything, basically everything, is found in the dungeon. All the different rumors and all the different hooks and everything all go back to the same dungeon. And I think it would have been more like a sandbox if the dungeon had been the main thing, but if a couple of these, like the were-bat, for example, that's sort of um, hunting the, the people, if that had left the dungeon, because that's where it was formed, but if it had left the dungeon and had settled in a nearby cave or something like that, and that way there was something other than just the dungeon to do. Uh, there is sort of a continuation of the adventure where you would go further and kind of explore more on the island, but it's really only hinted at, and, uh, and it really is beyond the adventure. It's dealing with a hag, and that would be really kind of beyond first-level characters, certainly. So it would be something you'd want to do at the end of this. Um, but the, 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 uh, the stuff that's going on in the dungeon is really cool, and I like the, uh, the, the presentation of the characters here. It's a really good idea to do this early on. I wish there were maybe a little more NPC art. Even if it's AI art, I think that would be cool here, rather than just nothing. But because the AI art is used at times throughout this book, and later on there's a lot of good art for uh, particular things. It'd be interesting. It would have been better, I think, to have a little bit here for the NPCs. You've got some cool random encounters, and they're all meaningful. They all do something. Um, either they are signs of what's to come, or they have an actual mechanical effect. If you're wandering around during the day, you're going to run into something. It's not just going to be a waste of time. It's sort of a hint, or it's a clue, or it'll lead into the dungeon later. And I think that's kind of cool, too. Um, or gives you a blessing, or gives you, you know, if, you, if you're kind to the beggar, for example, one of the doors in the tomb unlocks. It's kind of cool. You have daytime encounters and nighttime encounters. These rat images are really creepy, especially the one on the bottom right. <laughs> I think that's really creepy for me. For some, or I guess that's a were-bat, not really a rat, but either way, it's creepy. Um, and you've got this, you know, I, I, one thing I would, I would probably do here is I would probably choose these encounters because some of them are just a lot cooler than others. Like the Cryptic Messenger, the Adventuring Party, uh, the Werebat itself, I would probably just have those happen rather than roll. Because, you know, running into the Town Watch at night, it's not really that interesting. Running into uh, cultists at night, cultists might be kind of cool. Uh, giant Rats, 
less interesting to me. But the other things I think you could do in kind of a series. So I might roll, quote unquote, but actually just choose what happens. Uh, because you're probably not going to be wandering around a ton in town, and so you're not going to probably have a ton of random encounters. But you might. You could do that how you wish. Uh, a good breakdown of the points of interest in town and what's there, and everything that's presented is given a reason. Basically, there's a reason for this to be on the map. Uh, and there are a couple things that are added in that are a little bit, you know, add a little more interest there. For example, at the good inn, uh, Bogner, the, the, the innkeeper, tells tales of the old gods poorly. That's kind of cool, right? There's stuff like that. Um, the cemetery is maybe less, a little less, there's less of a reason to be there. The catacombs haven't been restored due to danger and economics because that's not the entrance to the catacombs. I mean, not really, unless that cemetery goes all the way from 8 up to 10, which I suppose it could. It doesn't look like it does. Um, but then everything else here is just a pretty straightforward starting town for D&D. There's a watch captain who has uh, you know quests to do or, or is willing to give rewards. There's an apothecary. There's a secluded tower with a mystic who can cast some spells. There's a chapel. Um, just the stuff you'd need for a, a blacksmith, of course. The stuff you'd need for a town. Now you get the dungeon features. And there are boons that you can achieve in the dungeon with a rule for that. And then the danger level of the dungeon. It's unsafe during the day, deadly at night. And then you have a ground level random encounters table. And one of the things I really like with this random encounter table is that seven is roll twice. So you're very likely to have two encounters at the same time or two of these things encountering each other. That's awesome because I think those sort of mixed encounters are much more interesting than single encounters where you, where you have two that are you know blended together. And I think that would be really cool. You have a rat pack fighting a crazed cultist, right? Or a zombie interacting with an imp. <laughs> or te you know, an imp teasing a zombie or something like that. Like, that would be cool. And I think you're much more likely to get those interesting things with that seven roll twice. Uh, so I think that's really cool. I think, uh, sometimes people put roll twice at like high end or low end of a random encounter table, but having it right in the middle at seven makes it the most likely thing. And that's really cool. Um, there's also, a, a number a 10 is a unique encounter, and so one, if you roll a 10, then you roll again on the 2d4 table for which random or which unique encounter you get, which means you're very unlikely to get these, right? Um, you're very unlikely to get the Werebat or an Adventuring Party or Black Cap Crinkle. Now, Black Cap, the Gelatinous Cube, for example, are, are in specific places in the dungeon, so you can run into them in their little lairs, very likely. So you're not likely to find them. But, you know, Ingrid or Eric and then the uh, adventuring party or the werebat you're really not likely to find. And so I think um, it, would be more, it would be better perhaps if, well, I'm not sure how to fix that exactly. Uh, maybe make it not a curve, maybe not make it a 2d4, maybe just make it a d8 or something. And if you roll, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, you know, uh, but, but it would be cool to have uh, these more likely encounters because, you know, encounters should be, you know, it's very often the case that the least interesting encounters are the ones you roll the most with a curved table. And uh, that's kind of, that's unfortunate because you, you want the most interesting ones to be the ones you roll. But this is a longer dungeon crawl. I mean, it's like, you know, two floors of about 20 rooms each. So you're looking at a couple, a few nights of, of play. And if you're going here at night, it's going to be deadly. So you're going to roll a lot of encounters. So maybe it'll come up a lot. You get gut dungeon descriptions. And one of the, my, my, um, Again, my, my preferences would be for there to be maps on each page. Uh, I understand that, you know, they just don't do that. It makes you have to kind of flip back and forth a little bit. That's not a big deal. Um, and the descriptions of the rooms are really cool. There's a lot of great stuff here. It, it, as I said before, it's a little stereotypical. And what I mean by that is there's nothing that's like, whoa, that's totally unique here. You're, you're, in, a, you're in a catacombs crypt that's been taken over by a cult and that has a lot of undead and that there's this hag uh, and a hag servant doing stuff. And so there's different like zones within the dungeon, but it's stuff we've seen before, right? It's a cult trying to spread disease. It's a, you know, a hag trying to kidnap children for a, a hag's, you know, witch trying to kidnap children for her mistress. Uh, there's undead who are trying to, you know, or I guess not trying to do anything. They're just, they're just there. <laughs> but there are some interesting features. For example, that black, uh, black cap goblin who's down here is really interesting. He's trying to, he's speaking to the dead and he's trying to find macabre stories because he really likes them. And so he's like writing them down or collecting them or something like that. That's a kind of cool NPC. He's not a bad guy. He's just down here. He can actually help you. Um, and there's some things like that where there's, oh, that's kind of an interesting character or an interesting uh, turn on this. But for the most part, it's pretty straightforward. It's a great, solid, um, low-level Shadow Dark dungeon crawl. 
I would say. And they're with a couple interesting features that really go, oh, wow, that's a that's kind of cool thing. Um, the Tome of Devils is an interesting uh, item. Um, the, uh, the There's a sort of... Uh, there's a couple of rooms that are particularly puzzle-like that you have to kind of figure out how to deal with. And that's kind of cool, too. I like that a lot. And I think there's a fair amount of NPC interaction. And that's really good. I mean, I think a lot of times, especially with more like generic dungeon crawls, there's a lot of just, okay, here we're going to fight this room, and there's this room, and there's traps in every room, and there's just not a lot of interaction for role play, uh, for players that prefer to role play. This dungeon has a good amount of that, uh, whether with ghost NPCs or revenant NPCs or actual adventuring parties that can be run into, you can run into them down here, or um, Agda herself, or just, just different things. Agda is the sort of um, servant of the hag down here. There's this cool interaction, of course, Black Cap, which I think he's really cool. Um, there's a couple of really good magic items down here. Um, there's this lawful warhammer that wants to kill demons, um, refuses to be used against lawful creatures, uh, and it can't be wielded by chaotic creatures. It's kind of interesting. It deals with this uh, revenant Edda who has been betrayed and cursed into undeath, and she's trapped down here, and you have to spread her story to free her. It's kind of a cool idea. Uh, but maybe she can fight with you. It's unclear if you free her. Um, she's she's lawful. Uh, a lawful undead. That's kind of interesting. Um, but anyway, yeah. There's a, a cool I magic out here. The Staff of Reliable Arcana. I really like that. It's a plus one staff. Um, gets lets you retry spells. and you, But it makes you kind of obsessed with detect magic. Now, one of the funny things is that whenever I have a, a wizard in my party who has detect magic, he basically already is obsessed with casting it. I just, it always seems to be the case. If you have Detect Magic, you cast it all the time. But this makes it, like, mechanical. It's the curse. You feel compelled to cast Detect Magic whenever you find treasure. It's kind of funny. There's the Bat Caves. Uh, the Shrine to Shafnir. Now, Shafnir, it's a long puzzle. And it involves these uh, notes that the statue gives you with a lot of particulars. And it sort of is the way to solve the problem. Or at least it's, it's one of the ways to cure the overall plague. Because there is a cure here. Um, or, or, you know, you, you might not say it's the same plague because I guess in the, in the notes here it just says he worked tires, tirelessly to cure a disease plaguing his town. It's not necessarily the one that is currently plaguing the town. You could make it that if you wanted. So I suppose that wouldn't necessarily be um, essential, but it seems like it would be a good connection to make. And if that's the case, this is a pretty hard puzzle. Um, I mean... You could shift it a bit, right? And and the notes that the DM or that the, the creator gives here are pretty wide. So, for example, one of the things you're supposed to do is tidy the room, and that one's pretty clear. Then there's another one uh, that says um, the note says Shafnir the studious, reading long into the night. Accommodations more suitable would make the back much less tight. And then the note is any reasonable effort the PCs put into making the study area more comfortable will be rewarded with the third note. So that's cool. It's not there's there's not a specific thing you have to do. It's if you generally make it more comfortable, if you do something that will work in that way. And and those are all kind of like that. Uh, one of them, I think, is, is kind of hard. It's the uh, shaft of the inspired potions by the pound. He'd work himself weary, weary till it put him in the ground. That one relates to taking breaks. I, I don't see that that would be what the players get from that one. <laughs> so you might want to shift it a bit or, or be willing to accept what the players do to solve the puzzle. Because, again, when, whenever you have puzzles with very specific solutions... You have to be okay with the players just running into a brick wall and not figuring it out. At least that's my experience. And if you don't want that to happen, you have to be very flexible in their solutions that they offer. There's a cool overview of the whole dungeon. I would probably separate this page out and keep it open while I'm playing or print it out if I was going to play this on the page. Just because it's all a breakdown, a quick breakdown of the whole thing. This is awesome. I wish this had happened actually first uh, before the room descriptions. Give this before the room descriptions would be, I think, better. Um, this is just the first floor. There's a second level with uh, another random encounter table. And this is harder. The stuff down here, you're less likely to run into... Well, actually, you're not likely to run into unique encounters, and I think that's, that's cool, too. Here you have one of the big bads of the dungeon, which is the Wretched Priest. This is uh, sort of the spirit of an old priest that, uh, uh, that is, you know, kind of animating the rats, and it's what's one of the big things that's going on, spreading the disease through the town and all of that. So you have to destroy this if you want the disease to end. But there's a lot going on down here. There's a necromancer spirit who wants his his um, book destroyed. It's a little interesting because there is a, a, a 
undead guy down here who has been cursed by the necromancer for trying to destroy the book. And if the players were to run into him first, they would think, okay, you were you were cursed for trying to destroy the book with own life, and then you'd meet the spirit, and he would say, yeah, destroy my book, right? And they would be like, well, wait, why did you do it to him? You know, the, the, the note here says he cursed the guy because he, he tried to destroy it while it was still useful to him, and now that he's dead, he doesn't want anyone else discovering it. So it makes sense, I guess, but I can see that being a bit of a, a trick for the players, and they might not appreciate that if they think, okay, well, we can't trust this guy because he's obviously going to do something to us if we try to destroy it. Why does he? Why is he trying to trick us to destroy it? Right? You, you could you could imagine some confusion there. Um, here's the second level, and uh, the same thing. You get a brief uh, overview of the whole thing. I really like that. And then you get the conclusions of what will happen if the PCs do these things or that things with then some notes for extra stuff that you might want to consider. For example, there's the Earl of the town who isn't really mentioned otherwise. He's not really talked about, like what's going on with the Earl and the politics there and how does everything connect down here. And, and the note is they don't really connect necessarily. It's kind of a place that has had a lot of different things, a lot of different powers come through and do stuff there. Um, and so there are some ways you could kind of expand it a bit, like with the cult or with the hag. And that's kind of cool. Again, you could uh, could really expand that out. One of the things is that this place has an inherent connection to different planes of existence, and I think you could definitely play with that a bit. One of the pools, or one of the uh, rooms in the first level of the dungeon is a pool which connects to the hag's domain, her little pocket faith dimension, but also to her her home out in the in the uh, in the swamp. But you could have that connect to other things too. Right? You could have it connect to the other planes if you wanted, and have this be much broader in its application uh, and in its use in your campaign. So that is the uh, Frostmire and the Catacombs of Whispering Rats. As you can see, it's, it's not really a sandbox. I wouldn't put it in that way, but it's definitely a dungeon crawl, and it's a good one. It's got a lot of cool stuff if you want creepy rats and plagues and hags and uh, you know giant werebats and all this stuff. It's a, it's a really cool starting adventure, and I think you could use this as a springboard to a further campaign. Um, all right, the next one is Sepulchre of Dusk. This one is much more focused in its tone, or focused in its scope, I would say, and its tone is very, very vivid. I really like the way that this is presented. Uh, Cutter Mountain Simulations uh, is the, uh, is the um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, producer of this. So it's an introductory Shadow Dark adventure for a game master up to four players. It includes pre-gen characters, which kind of tie in, at least one of them really clearly ties into the the beginning of the story, you don't have to use them. But it would be, I would imagine you'd use this as sort of like a, hey, here are your characters, you know, for brand new, brand new players. Uh, the idea is that there was a wedding feast at this sort of barbarian or at least frontier town, uh, and the groomsmen didn't show up, or the groom didn't show up, and so then the riders show up and it turns out there was an ambush and the goblin tribes have attacked and killed a bunch of people and captured the, the groom and taken off other people and, and uh, now you have to rescue them as quickly as you can, and so you kind of chase after the goblins and you get to their place, and it's this huge warren under the ground, and it's really dangerous. Like, there are hundreds of goblins there. You can't just attack it. So there's a back door through this old barrow that the goblins have tried to seal off, and you have to sneak through. But one of the things that this uh, makes clear is that you're going to try to encourage, as it says a note to the game master, it is important to convey the stifling weight of the great mass of earth above the PC's heads. And I think that this book does a great job of, of imposing that on you, the DM. The images that are used, the descriptions that are used, the questions that are sometimes asked at the end of certain descriptions, the certain descriptive paragraphs, really good at giving you this impression of age and of like darkness, of it pressing in, being claustrophobic, of it being very, you know, like, very, very scary in that sense. Your torch could go out at any moment and be left in pitch black. You really feel that in this dungeon in the writing of it. I like that a lot. It fits right into the tone of Shadow Dark really, really well. There are some random tables at the beginning, depending on if you're in a flooded area or a dry area, because the, the entire barrow is kind of turned at an angle, and so the left side of it is basically all flooded, the right side of it is all dry, and so you can kind of proceed through it as you choose. The players can, I should say. They, they don't necessarily know the difference between the two, except one is in the water and the other one seems to be more intact. And so if you kind of want, yeah, it's a cool way, it's a kind of a cool choice. Do we want to go through the more flooded, the more rotten, the more broken areas of the tomb? Or do we want to try to go through the more intact, drier, but you know maybe the traps are still active sort of side of things? And I think that's really cool. 
there's that there's that clear choice. And you get an image of the whole dungeon right here. It's not too big, 18 rooms, all said and done. But you can see very clearly there's like a, a choice of path through this dungeon. You can go left or right and go through those flooded areas, rooms three, five, six, eight, nine. Or you can go through the unflooded, the non-flooded areas, two, four, seven, and beyond with some side passages that you can go into. And that's really cool, really, really cool. And eventually you can kind of shift from the right over to the left. You eventually have to go left up through into the Goblin Warrens. But it's really cool that you have that choice and the players are going to feel that, okay, we can we can proceed how we want to go. We can go through the flood or we can go through the dry. Um, and depending on the party makeup, depending on you know what they want, that's that's their choice there. So the, the, the choices are not just left or right. And I think that's really cool. It's made very clear, okay, you have actual choice about how you're going to proceed through this dungeon. That's awesome. Now, one of the things that each of these rooms has is uh, the, the breakdown is right there. Light, smell, sounds, danger, and creatures, traps, if they're, if they're listed, and uh, the examining f further features. So each of these rooms is really well um, is laid out very well. It's easy to see the whole thing, but there's a lot of information about each room. A lot of information, like there's a whole column for each room. Even if the rooms themselves, usually there's not just a boring room. They're almost all interesting, but there's a lot of information about each room. So yes, you can run it quickly. And I think this is a great way of presenting a lot of information easily and, and, and uh, clearly. But there is a lot of information, even for sort of a minimalist approach. Now, one thing this, this book does is it shows you a dungeon or the map on every spread. Awesome. So you know exactly where you are. You know what's coming. You never have to flip. That's incredible. Flooded tunnels, dusty tunnels, halls of warriors. There's a lot of traps down here. A lot of traps down here. Um, a lot of hazards down here. And then there are some golems that are that one of them is more intact, and it seems like it'd be a very dangerous fight. The other one is a little less intact. It's more of like a, it's more of like a you know, inconvenience than a than a real real dungeon, but you know, hazard or something like that. A real real uh, problem. But it still it still is something that would be an inconvenience for the party. And again, they're not going to know how to how to proceed through it. But with you know, they're not going to know the difference necessarily offhand. <laughs> um, one of the really cool rooms in this dungeon, I think it stands out, is the Chamber of Sacrifice. There's this really cool uh, mural on the wall, and if you fail a wisdom check, you're drawn physically into it, and you have to fight the things in the uh, in the mural. And if you die, you just become part of the mural. But if you survive, you come out with a treasure and get some XP. Now, it sounds like only one person is drawn in, which is fine. You know, it's just one character. But, it, well, it doesn't necessarily say it. It says... Uh, DC 15 wisdom or viewer is physically drawn into the artwork. Others see the victim shrink. So maybe a couple people could be drawn in, and then you could just say that there's multiple beastmen, um, and they'd have to repel them and, and try to survive. But uh, I could imagine it being just one character, and then everyone else kind of just watches, which wouldn't be as cool, but I think the idea is awesome. But there's a couple other really interesting rooms too, with creepy creatures, whites, and ghouls. The Hall of Heroes, the Team of Champions and all of that. Uh, there are a handful of rooms where there are some optional treasures, for example, in the grotto. There is a green light that's growing under, that's glowing under the, uh, under the ground. Um, and, uh, or is that back in, sorry, that's back in room nine. That's right, back in room nine. There is a, a green light that's glowing under the ground and you can swim down and try to see what's down there. And there's some treasure. Um, you can find some poor treasure down there. But then you get up eventually to the Deep Hall Blades, which is the low levels of the Goblin Warren. And one of the things it says is like, look, if you go past this in the north or west direction, you're just going to run into lots of goblins, hundreds of them, and they're just going to get captured or killed. So results at GM's discretion. And I think that's fair. Like, you know, keep in mind the players, you should, you should make it very clear there are lots and lots of goblins in that direction. And so maybe go the other way if you're interested in not getting immediately destroyed, <laughs> right? Um, so, but you're trying to find the prison, and you find the the, the 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 prison, and you can rescue the the groomsman or the groom and his uh, his assistant. Now, one thing that's interesting is the methods of escape, right? There's a four that are listed. Um, you could either go back to the fissure in area nine and just kind of toboggan through. You could just do a narrative and let the players kind of say, okay, well, I throw gold, I, I lose this item, I lose, and just kind of have a quick description of how you get out. You could role play it and try to like, you know, get get out diplomatically, or you could just 
play, keep playing, right, and go back the long way and just try to play normally until you get back to area one. Um, now those are just four, perhaps four options. There could be others, I suppose, but those would be the main four. An option is probably not going to be fighting through all the goblins. Right? There are hundreds of them. That's not going to work. But maybe collapsing the tunnel or something like that, you know, so that they can't follow you, or who knows what. But that would be one way of doing it. And then there's the return of the heroes. Days later, the party returns with the bridegroom, without the bridegroom, or not at all. And then at the very end, there's a one-page Duchy of Black Peak with a little bit of information about the region and a note that, hey, there's more adventures in campaign setting material for this coming soon. That's cool. I think I would like that the, the, the bit that's hinted at here sounds really cool as a frontier. I like it. Here are the pre-made characters. There's Durek, Fazek, Lenka, and Mikhail. Uh, just, you know, Shadow Dark characters. Um, just presented really easily for your, uh, for your convenience, if you need. And they're, you know, thief, fighter, fighter, and wizard. There's no priest, but the uh, other four are, the other three classes are presented. So that's the Sepulchre of D Dusk. Now, the, as I mentioned before, one of those characters, the Goblin, is particularly important for the campaign. He's in exile from this place. He's the one who knows about the, this back door. And so if he's not in the party, the note says you should have uh, one of the players has discussed it with him before, like they heard about it over a game of dice or something like that in the past winter, and so they know about it uh, the back way in. Now, one of the things that just sort of assumes the players will try that back way, right? So if the players are like, no, we're going to go talk to the goblins at the front, we're going to try to investigate because we know, and it makes it clear, not every goblin is happy about this. Some of them are actually very unhappy about this ambush, this breaking of the treaty, and they're actually not on the side of the, the new goblin ruler. Well, if the players know that, then, or they suspect that, then they might try a different approach. They might just go straight for the front. So it's one of those things where if you don't want that to happen, you just say to the players, hey, you're going through the back door, <laughs> right? Like, uh, you know, you have this whole setup, you, you go there, you come, and, and, and you arrive at the back door, and you're right there. If you just say, okay, here, if you, if you start it at the ambush site or back in town and you have players discuss and role play, you can't guarantee that they're going to go here. So you know, keep that in mind. If you really want them to do this adventure, if it's going to be a one-shot, give them their pre-made characters, read them through that background material, and narrate it all the way up through, and now you're standing at front in front of the doors to the back, you know, the back door. <laughs> and then and then just let them go from there. All right, the last of these is the Swamp Dragon Cult by the Elven Tower. Or by Elven Tower, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's Elven Tower. Uh, the maps are by Maps and Quests. Now, this is designed for Shadow Dark, but it really does have a much more 5th edition feel. It, just in terms of it's like, it's not a dungeon crawl exactly, it's more like location-based. Um, you're going through a regular town, then there's a second region, then there's a third region. It feels much more like a, um, yeah, like you might see in any uh, Wizards of the Coast product, I would say. And not, and again, that's not in a negative way. I like Wizards of the Coast products, but it does have kind of like a first you're here, then you're there, then you're there sort of thing. There's going to be a lot more role-playing. There's going to be a lot more discussion. It's not really a dungeon crawl. So in that sense, this is not like... You could really easily take this and put it into any other kind of game. It doesn't have to be Shadow Dark. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to fit particularly well with the Shadow Dark system. Maybe that's the way of putting it. I think the first two both fit really well with the Shadow Dark system. They, they, they lean into what makes Shadow Dark good, uh, great. The Swamp Dragon Cult is more generic. It could go with almost any game. But it's statted out here for Shadow Dark, and it works totally well for Shadow Dark. Again, it's just not a particularly excellent fit. Um, or I shouldn't say it's a one-to-one -one correspondence with what I think makes Shadow Dark Shadow Dark, really. But I do really like it because it's got that dragon element, and not a lot of games do. I mean, a lot of, especially not low-level adventures, you're not running into dragons. And so you have a good primer here, and it's laid out very well. Very, very well. You get the background of the main villain, which is great. I think that's awesome. And then you get the actual you know, the cult, which is actually operating, and then the hooks and the rumors that go right along with it. You get the first town, which is Strasterton. Strasterton, yeah, I think that's how you say it. It comes outside of Straster City. And there's just general features of the town, pointers about what's happening there, random events in town, and then the description of each location. Here's a quick map. And it's interesting, it says, note that the town is probably bigger than what you're looking at here. In fact, it is definitely bigger than what you're looking at here. But this is just a brief overview of, of one portion of town with the most important stuff that you're going to go see. But you could spread this out. You wouldn't have to have it be the only places in town, certainly. Uh, there's a lot of characters to interact with, some, some interesting ones, a few extra quests. One thing is that almost every quest 
leads directly down the main line, and so there it's it feels a little bit more like you know like World of Warcraft or something or or any other game where you're like, hey, here's another reason to go do the thing you're already supposed to be doing, um, instead of just trying to stop the cult and saving this guy's daughter and you know getting paid. There's also a horse that's been stolen, and he will pay you five gold to get your horse back, you know, or something like that. <laughs> so there's a bunch of reasons to go do the main thing, and they all point in the same direction, which is fine. Again, this is not trying to be a, a sandbox. This is not trying to be a hex crawl. This is a this is a linear adventure in that way. You're going to start here. You're going to talk to people. You're going to figure out your quest. Then you're going to go to the next place. You're going to do what needs to be done there. And then you're going to go to the final place and deal with what needs to be done there. With one exception as one kind of side trek that is offered as an option. But it's kind of hard to see why you would do it. Uh, but I'll get to that in a minute here. So you get the town with all the stuff happening there. Um, and again, as I said, there's some cool stuff there. Some good characters to interact with. They're interesting. A couple typos here or there, but it's not bad. Uh, really, it isn't bad at all. Just a little bit too late. Just a bit too late. This is, I think, my favorite of this, the favorite encounter in this thing. You are going to this uh, keep, uh, this fort, where you're told that you're gonna, you can learn more about the cult's activities. Basically, uh, the, you're, you're kind of led here as the next place to go. But as you arrive, there's a big fire, and the cult has already attacked and has snuck inside and has you know, been led inside by a traitor inside, and now there's fighting, and there's burning, and there's people that are in danger, and you kind of have to rush around quickly, and there's fights happening, and fire being thrown everywhere, and... It's a cool encounter. It's, it would be very frantic, I think, and it would be very uh, vivid in the players' imaginations. They'd know they'd, ha they'd have to act quickly. There would be a, a timer, right? A threat and a treat to go to the room ha rune hammer thing. There's certainly threats. There's certainly a timer, and then there'd be lots of treats all over the place. Items you can get, allies you can save. Um, so it's a great. It's a well-designed uh, scene, and this could be a whole night of play. It'd probably be an hour or two, but you could play. Um, you could probably play this whole this whole adventure in one setting as a one shot, but. This particular part, I think, would be the highlight. Everyone would come back, kind of come back to this, I think, and remember it. Uh, there's a, a keep with the various buildings and, and different threats in the different towns, things happening there. Um, yeah, it's great. Totally solid. I, I really like this part of, the, part of the adventure. I think it's my favorite. When you get to the Swamp Dragon Cult hideout, things are a little bit less interesting to me. For one reason, for one thing, is the dragon himself is not interested in the cult. He's just out doing his own thing, and the cult is trying to kind of like gain his favor, and they've already failed once. And so he's not really a part of the adventure so much. You can go see him. But one of the things that um, it makes clear is that there isn't really going to be a benefit for going to see him. For example, as it says, he does not comply with any requests. And if he's pestered beyond one minute, he won't show any mercy, and he'll just kill them. So yeah, there's a dragon here. And yes, uh, he is, he is uh, you know, like a part of the adventure, but it's like you can, you can go see him, but there's no reason to. He's not going to do anything you say. He's not going to do anything. And, and if you stay too long and bother him, keep pestering, he'll, he'll just kill you. I think there could have been a, a much better execution of this dragon. Now, one thing is true is that, you know, you could try to negotiate with him to like say, hey, we'll guarantee you food. Don't go attack the people. But they don't know about him anyway. He's not currently attacking the people. I mean, he does eat livestock, but they're not really sure that it's him. They think it's the cult. Uh, so it's not like he's an immediate threat to the town. He's not threatening to destroy it. He's not going to burn it down or, or, you know, uh, <laughs> or, or melt it down or whatever it might be. So yes, he's a part of the adventure, and I'm glad that he's there. But I think I would probably run him differently, or I would do, I would, you know, connect him more to the cult directly, maybe make it more of an active threat from the dragon such that the players do have to kind of figure out a solution to this aspect of it. The cult itself is just kind of hanging out nearby in, a, in its own towers, and its own keep. And you can go there and you can try to pretend to be, you know, it sort of assumes that you're going to kind of walk right in. <laughs> and then it says, you know, there's sort of like a set thing that happens. It says, when you enter inside, um, Harold says from behind his men, we welcome you in peace, but this is a temporary truce. So it's kind of like a scripted thing that you say um, when you go into the into this place. So, I mean, I assume the players aren't just going to walk through the front door, but they might. And if they do and they try to bluff their way in, then there is a set thing that will happen. And then they can be tricked. Uh, if they don't just wholeheartedly join, then he's going to attack them you know, and try to surprise them and all this stuff. So I don't think a player, a party is going to do that. But, you know, if they do, it's all kind of scripted for you here. Then you have the tower itself, 
and you know the, the the adventure conclusion of what you can do afterwards. Once you've killed him or captured him and brought him back to town, um, the dragon's still there, and the livestock is still stolen. You know, the what do you do? You don't have to do anything. You could be the end of your adventure and you're all done, but you're definitely not going to be able to kill the dragon right now. And I like that because it says, look, well, this is going to be an adventure for another day. How can you aspire to defeat this monster? Well, that's going to be the beginning of a quest line. Maybe get allies or find a dragon slaying spear or, you know, finding a way to deal with it would be its own adventure. But it's beyond the scope of this one. So that's cool. It leaves the, the, the door open for a new one. So overall... I think the Swamp Dragon Cult is my least favorite of these three. I think it's it's kind of more generic. It's kind of more like, hey, this is uh, this could be you know for any game, not just Shadow Dark. It doesn't lean into the Shadow Dark stuff, you know, that makes I think Shadow Dark very interesting, like the the live timer or the uh, or just the simplicity of it, the dungeon crawling mechanics of it. But it, it also doesn't lean away from those. Uh, and so again, it's 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 a, it's fine. It's totally good fit there. <laughs> it's just you could put this in any system of choice. And actually, that's. That's true for all of these to some degree, but especially this one, I would say. It's very linear, which is not usually my preference. I prefer more of a regional or a sandbox uh, thing, but so is the second. Um, this one is great in that it has a dragon. I think I would probably change the way the dragon is used, but I like that it has it. And the dragon cult is always a cool idea. We've seen it before, but it's a good idea. Yeah, it's a classic. So the Swamp Dragon Cult is a, is a totally solid level one adventure, and I like that it leads you into a further... How do we deal with this now, this dragon, after the fact? Okay, so Swamp Dragon Cult, Sepulchre of Dusk, Frostmire, and the Catacombs of Whispering Rats. Three great adventures for Shadow Dark, three solid adventures for Shadow Dark. Um, great ways to start off a campaign, any of them. Uh, but I think especially this first one is my favorite, Frostmire and the Catacombs of Whispering Rats. I think it's my favorite in terms of it's the, the actual dungeon itself. The second is really flavorful, and I like that dark, heavy tone. And I say heavy is like, you know, impressing down claustrophobic tone that it really gives you. So I'll let, put the links below to where you can get all three of these. All right, guys, I hope this was interesting, and I'll see you in another video.